Luke chapter number 16, and as always, I'm going to read the entire chapter. You can follow along silently while I read. Starting verse number 1, the Bible reads, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man, which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? To give an account of thy stewardship, for thou, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, In a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, In a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. And the Lord commanded, commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided it. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth in, into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach tonight. Dear God, I pray that you would please just uh, fill me with your spirit and with your power, dear God. Help me to, to make your words plain. Help me to preach the truth in love, dear God, and I pray that everybody here would have ears to hear and hearts to understand, dear God, and that all of us, myself included, would be able to walk away today, either edified or, or learning something new, dear God, and just uh, invigor invigorated and maybe more impassioned to, uh, to serve you and to win souls to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now my sermon tonight, I'm going to be discussing the necessity of going out soul winning. As I mentioned earlier in the announcements, you know, this is a, this is a soul winning church. We're an independent fundamental Baptist church, and we're a soul winning church, which means that one of the primary focuses of this church is going out and, and bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ unto the lost. That is our great commission. That is, some, that is one of the most important things we can do as Christians, 
is to bring that gospel and that message to other people. And I have three main points that I'm going to bring up on why it's so necessary to go soul winning. And the first one is hell. Hell is a very, very real place. Now, it might not be very, it's not very popular. This is not a subject that, that is fun to preach about. This is not something that's, that's, that's nice or that sits well with pretty much anybody. I mean, thinking about hell and the reality of hell. But it's something that I believe that, that we all need to do from time to time so that we have the proper focus and we can get our hearts in the right place. Because just fully comprehending the reality of hell, we don't see hell in our day-to-day -day life. We have to read the Bible and by faith believe that it exists. And just, and just understand by all the descriptions that we get here how horrible the place it really is. It's so easy to get caught up in our day-to-day -day routines and doing work and doing everything else that we do to not be thinking about, I mean, no one's going to be thinking about hell all the time. I mean, I don't think they should be thinking about it all the time. But it's something that we do need to come back to and say, hey, wait, we need to look at this. And we're going to look at this chapter where we're just reading. In verse number 19, this is the story about Lazarus and the rich man. And, of course, this is a very, very good description of what hell is actually like and the torment and pain. See, a lot of people today, they either don't believe hell is a real place and they just want to, like a lot of people, it's nice to think, they might want to think that everybody's going to heaven when they die. But that's not the truth. I mean, the truth is that hell is a real place. And that this is not a place where you're just going to be disintegrated and, and, and just, that's the end of your existence and wiped out. This is a place where people go, and people are right now, and they're being tortured and tormented night and day, and they have no rest. This is a horrible place. We can see in verse number 23 in the chapter here in Luke 16, it says, and in hell, he lived up his eyes, being in torments. Hell is a place of torments. It's terrible. And then in verse 24, right at the end, it says, for I am tormented in this flame. It's, a, it, it's literally a place of fire and burning and torture and torment. This isn't just talking figuratively. I mean, if this was talking figuratively, why in the world would he ask for Lazarus to come and dip his finger in water and put it on his tongue. He's, he's asking Father Abraham. He's like, Father Abraham. In verse 24, he cried, said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. This is a, de a description of something that's going on. Now, a lot of people I've heard say, well, this is just a parable. That's just kind of relating some things and relating some kind of a truth. There's a lot of parables in the Bible, and there's a lot of parables that are used to explain things and, and explain biblical truths, but none of the parables use a man's actual name. And in this story, I believe this is a real story about a man that, that was named Lazarus, that actually existed, and this rich man, and, and that these are things that actually happened. And he's talking about, you know, how, how um, Lazarus met Abraham when he, when he died. He went to heaven, and he's with, with Abraham, and... This rich man ended up going to hell. And this is a description. And we're going to see many other descriptions, it's not just this one, that explain how horrible of a place hell is. And then the reason why we have to get this in, in our minds and get this in our hearts is to understand people are going there. People are there right now. And unless we do something about that, unless we go out and preach the gospel, people are continue, and people will continue to go there, but we have that opportunity to make an impact in somebody else's life that they're, the course of their soul, the, the eternal destination of their soul could be changed forever from going to a place of torments to going to a place of burning into going to heaven and being with God forever. Now, we're going to look at the first mention of hells in Deuteronomy chapter number 32. You go ahead and turn there if you'd like. Deuteronomy chapter number 32. This is the first time the word hell is used in the King James Bible. It's in Deuteronomy chapter number 32. In verse number 22, the Bible says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Again, and you're going to see this as we go through these. So many people try to say, well, fire, that's all just figurative, and it's just the separation from God, and that it's really just... Um, you know, you're gonna, people are just going to be upset. It's just not quite as good as heaven because they're just going to be away from God. That's just going to make them sad. No. I mean, from the very first reference, this is talking about fire is kindled, 
burn in the lowest hell, consume the earth, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Four times he's talking about fire, consuming. This is not just a figurative use of language. This is real, this is real fire. And it's kindled by God's anger. God is angry with the wicked. You know, God is, I mentioned this in my sermon this morning, God is a loving God. Yes, God is love. God has extreme and tender mercies. And it's because of God's love why we even get to go to heaven in the first place, his mercy and his truth. But he also has wrath. God has wrath. God has anger. And God is the one who created hell. A lot of people like to say, well, you know, a loving God wouldn't send somebody to hell. But, but a loving God would. There is, God is a God of justice. God is a God that, that says, look, these are the laws, and this is the punishment for the law. Now, he also has offered to extend mercy through, his, through the blood of Jesus Christ, who paid for our sins, and he paid that punishment for us. Yet God is still a God of justice, and this punishment exists as a real place. Now, I'm going to go through a few more places here. You don't have to turn to them. But just to help get this idea of hell in our mind, because... Again, it's not pleasant. It's not something I even like to think about, but we need to do this. So I'm going to read a few of these scriptures for you. You don't have to turn to all these references. In Psalm 18:5, the Bible reads, The sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. Hell is a place of great sorrow. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, the Bible reads, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into to hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off, it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In all those verses, he repeated the same thing three times. And he's trying to get it through to us. Look. Hell is a place of fire that never shall be quenched. It is eternal. Just as much as our eternal life is eternal, that is going to last forever. If you're saved, if you're a believer, if you're born again, you are saved and you are set forever. Nothing will ever change that. You have no way you're going to go to hell. But on the other hand, if you die and you're not saved and you go to hell, that is an eternal punishment. And, and you know, we hear all of this, the fire not being quenched, the worm dying not you know, all these horrible descriptions of hell, I think the worst part about all of that is that it's everlasting. There is no hope for a person once they go to hell. It's over. It's done. They, they are in that place, and they're there forever. Their chance to get saved and to avoid that place is completely gone. And that's something, you know, I was talking to a couple teenagers today, and I'm trying to explain this, you know, this punishment of hell, and it's almost like a joke to them. And a lot of people treat it that way. And I, I realize, you know, it's not normal conversation for people to have day to day. You don't expect someone just to walk up to you on the street and just start talking to you about hell. And that wasn't the only thing I talked about. But, you know, when someone, when someone brings that up, you know, it just, a lot of people have this attitude of just kind of like making a mockery or a joke. And just, you know, oh, yeah, hell yeah, whatever. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to hell. And they'll laugh about it, saying, yeah, I'm going to be, I'd rather, what is it, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven or something like that. You're not going to be ruling in hell. Anyone that goes to hell, they're not going to be ruling. They're going to be tortured. They're going to be tormented. They're going to be suffering. It's not something to joke about. This is something that's serious. This is something, I mean, it's in the Bible. It's the truth. It's not something that's, um, just because you can't see it, it doesn't make it un, you know, not real. That's another thing people have, I've heard so many times. People like to think, well, I don't believe in hell, therefore it doesn't exist. And that's such faulty reasoning. I mean, I like to, to I, I'll use this example. I'll say, okay, I'm from Chicago. Originally, I'm from Chicago. That's where I was born and raised. And I'll ask them, say, have you ever been to Chicago? And out here, a lot of people haven't been, so you know, they say no. I say, well, do you believe it's real? Is it a real place? Oh, of course it is, you know. Well, you've never been there. You've never seen it. I mean, yeah, there's a map that says it's there, but, but you haven't been there, so how would you know it's real? And it's just that type of thinking just to get you to understand, like, look, you don't have to see hell to know it's real. The Bible tells us it's there. We just have to believe God's word. And it is there. It's a real place, and we need to, we need to keep this in our minds because it's so easy, especially if you're saved and you've been saved for a long time and maybe you have a lot of saved friends. 
Maybe you have a lot of people that, you know, they're on their way to heaven. It's easier to forget about these things and to forget that, that hell is a real place. And there's, I mean, the multitude of people are not saved. The disciples asked Jesus Christ, said, are there, are there few that be saved? And basically he said yes, because he said, straight is the gate is, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto, unto life, and few there be that find it. But, but um, broad is the, is the way, and, and wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that go in there at. And I know I didn't quote that exactly right, but he was saying that basically most people are going to hell because wide is the gate that leadeth that way. And only a few people are going to be saved. And it's not because it's difficult, it's because there's only one way. When he said straight, it just means narrow. So a narrow way, it's, it's because it's only through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And there are billions of people in the world, in the world today that are believing in other religions and in other gods and in other ways to get to heaven, whether it be Muslims, Hindus, you know, whatever. And even lots of other people who call themselves Christians, too, have not just, just accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. There's many ways to get into hell. There's one way to get into heaven. Jude 1.7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set for, forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It lasts forever. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And here's a, there's a great verse that shows that, look, the everlasting destruction in hell, that's not separation from God. That everlasting destru destruction is coming from God. That's coming from the presence of God. If you see there in verse number 9, well, you, I didn't have your turn there, but 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, I'll read it again for you. It says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Matthew 13, 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And a little bit further down in that chapter, in verse 49, it says, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a fire of great pain, torture, and torment. Not only that, you have to listen to people. There's going to be wailing, gnashing of teeth. I mean, it's, it's a horrible place. Revelation 14. Again, another, another instance that explains that this is not just separation from God, but the wrath of God is actually what, what kindles hell. And, we're, and, and that you're going to, I think everyone there is going to understand why they're there and that it's coming from God. It's not that they're just separated from Him. It says in verse 9 of Revelation 14, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The people in hell are going to be in the presence of the Lamb, the Lamb, of course, being Jesus Christ. They're not going to be separated from him. They're going to be receiving punishment from him. And in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Another example is showing that it's eternal. It's everlasting. People go there. They're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And it says here, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. John 3.36 explains, we saw in Revelation 14, it's the wrath of God which is poured out. John 3.36 explains, why this is so important? Why am I taking so much time to explain hell? John 3.36 has the answer, why? It says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth. Those that don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are going to this place. 
And this is this is point number one of why it's so important to go soul winning. And not only is it important for our own family and our own friends, there's so many people in this world that, that are close to me. I have relatives that are not saved. And it, and it pains me to think, and I, and I love them. I mean, a lot of people you know that might not be believers can be really nice people. People that, that you, would, you would hate to think anything horrible to ever happen to them. And just to, to let that sink in, they can be gone tomorrow. We don't know what a day is going to bring forth. I mean, tragedies happen all the time. A little less than a month ago, I was at work. I was in the office, just working away on a computer program. I sit at my desk, doing my job. There's another girl that works there, received a phone call. Her husband was just shot and killed. In, at work that day, just, I mean, it's a regular day, you go in, you're doing your thing, it's your regular routine, the worst call you could probably ever imagine receiving. He's gone. That could happen to any one of us, to any one of our friends, anybody that we know, which is why it's so important that we remember these things and, and, and focus on them. Hell is a real place, my friend. I don't know that man. I don't know if that man was saved. I really hope that he was. But if he wasn't, there's one place where he is right now. And that's a place where a lot of people are going to be going. And we need to be conscious of that and remember that. This is not just a joke. This is not a game. This is serious. People will be tormented for an eternity if they don't have Christ as their Savior. And God is not the God, and we're going we're gonna to get this to my next point. God does not just save people at random. We do not believe in Calvinism. We do not believe that God just picks and chooses and says, you're saved, you're saved, you're not, you're saved, you're not, you're saved. God doesn't do that. God's given us free will. He's given us an opportunity to put our faith in Christ. He wants us to do that, but he doesn't make us do that. He doesn't force us to do that. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not want to send people to hell. But that is what's going to happen. God has committed to us the reconciliation. I'm going to get to that in one of my further points. My second point of the necessity of soul winning. Why is it so important about soul winning? Is that faith comes by hearing. So the first point is hell. The second point is hearing. Romans chapter 10. Turn there if you would. Romans chapter number 10. See, it's impossible... We know that, that, that faith, in order, in order to be saved, you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You have to believe on it. It's impossible to believe something unless you've heard of it. If someone has never heard the name of Jesus Christ, if someone has never heard the gospel, there's no way they could believe in that. It's impossible. I mean, if you don't know something, you've never heard about it, it's impossible to believe on it. So many people, I've gone out and I talk to people every week. A lot of people have said, wow, I've never heard the gospel you know, preached before. I've never heard that before. And yet a lot of the same people will say, you know, they just think they've been saved for a really long time. Even though they've never heard that, that faith comes only through Jesus Christ. It's not by the law. It's an eternal gift. It lasts forever. People say they don't hear this, yet they think they've been saved for a long time, but they've deceived themselves. And I'm here to tell you, unless you completely believe 100% in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not saved. If you think it takes obeying the commandments plus Jesus, if you think it takes baptism plus Jesus, if you think it takes circumcision plus Jesus, as they did in Jesus' day, anything that you add to that, you're not saved. You don't have all of your faith on Jesus Christ. We need to put all of our faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is all based on whether or not you believe. So if you don't believe correct on salvation, then you have a problem there. Because salvation is completely based on our belief. John uh, 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Whether or not we go to heaven or hell is all based on one thing in our belief. So that belief has to be accurate. It has to line up with what the Bible says is required of us to believe. And I'm not trying to make it a difficult thing because God has not made it a difficult thing. He's made it extremely easy for us to get saved. The faith is simple. We just need the faith of a child, but we need to just rely on Jesus Christ. And I believe the reason why he says we need the faith of a child is because the same way that my children that are sitting here in the front row 
They are not able to feed themselves. They're not able to support themselves. They're not able to provide a roof over their head. They have to rely on me to do that for them. And they do. And they trust. They're, they, they're not worried about whether they're going to eat dinner tomorrow, whether they're going to you know, have clothes to put on or anything like that, because they're just fully trusting that we're going to take care of them. And we do. And it's the same type of childlike faith that we need to have in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in Him and just say, you know what? I'm not good enough. My works can't save me. It's not how good I am. It's not the, the amount of church I go to. It's not the amount of prayer I have. It's not the amount of people I help. I just have to rely on Jesus Christ to save me. He paid for my way to heaven. I'm putting my faith in Him. Are you in Romans chapter 10? Look down at what it says in verse number 8. We'll start there. But what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in, the, in, the, in thy mouth, excuse me, and in thy heart? That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Very simple. That's exactly what I was trying to describe. Is that, you know, we believe, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You call on God, just call on God, ask him to save you. You're saved. It's as simple as that. Verse 11, for what, say, what for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So he's saying, first of all, no one's going to be calling on God to save them if they don't even believe him. You have to believe on God in order to call out to him to save you. And then he says, and how shall they believe in him of, of whom they have not heard? It's impossible to, to believe in something if you haven't heard about it. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So how is anybody going to hear the gospel? How is anybody going to hear in order to believe the gospel if they don't have a preacher to preach it to them so that they can hear it? They don't have someone speaking and using their mouth to say, look, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for all of your sins. I want you to be saved, but you have to believe this. They need to hear that in order to even have the opportunity to get saved. Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It's ex extremely important the soul winning that we do, we send people out to go out and bring the gospel. Because he says here, you know, it's the, how beautiful are the feet. Feet means you're going and doing something. It's not just bringing people in and getting them saved, which is a real common movement today. I'm all for people coming into church and, and someone preaching them the gospel and them getting saved. I love it. But that's not the purpose of church. The purpose of church is for the believers, for the baptized, born-again believers for the edification of the saints, it's for teaching, it's for singing praises unto God. The preaching the gospel is we go out. We go out to the lost. We bring the gospel. We bring it to them. We preach it to them. We don't even just hand them a tract. This is one of the reasons why we don't, our church doesn't just go out and pass out flyers. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God It's not just reading. If it were reading, I'd just give them a Bible. I mean, anything that man's going to write down isn't going to be as good as, as, as what God's word is anyways. I would say, here, read this, get saved. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that, that you have to, um, faith cometh by reading. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, we need to have the word of God. We can't just explain salvation. We need to bring God's word. God's word is what's powerful. God's word is what's, what's sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word is what's going to pierce through their heart. I mean, my own words, I am not going to convince someone to make a decision on whether or not, what they're going to trust for their soul to go to heaven just based on, on, on my great words. My words are not that powerful. That's why we need God's word. God's word is. God's word will make people, I mean, and it's almost, it seems like foolishness. It's foolishness of preaching. God has used, again, that's a little bit later on, I'm jumping ahead of myself. It might seem foolish, but, but that's the way God made it. And he says here that we need, you know, people need to preach the gospel in order for people to hear about it and believe and get saved. I mean, it's all lined out here in Romans chapter number 10. 
and a few more places that, that explain about just hearing. Ephesians 1.13, I read this verse this morning where I explained exactly about the name of Word of Truth Baptist Church. I gave a lot of reasons and a lot of behind the meaning of our name and what we're here to do. In Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So over and over again, we're going to see it. I'm, man, I keep on getting ahead of myself here. You have to hear God's word in order to receive it, in order to believe it, and to get saved. John 5.24. This is my favorite verse in the entire Bible, and every time I go out so morning, I try to use this verse. Because to me, this, is, this is, makes everything so clear. Maybe not everyone understands it the same way, or, or it's as clear to them. But to me, I, I can't get any clearer than this. A promise made by Jesus Christ in John 5, 24. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Again, he's saying, you have to hear the word and believe. The only way that you can believe God's word, believe on the word of God, believe on Jesus Christ, which is the word, is by hearing it. You have to, you have to hear it. You have to understand it. Hebrews 4, 2, you don't have to turn there. It says, for unto us the gospel, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's God's word that we need to bring to the people for them to hear in order to make that decision on whether or not they're going to believe God, they're going to believe his word, they're going to believe his promise, they're going to believe his gift for us. We have to bring it to them. Oftentimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear people, and you know, if you use a track when you go out soul winning, I'm not against that either. I thought it would be clear. Okay, a lot of people use that. We have invitations. I, have, I don't think I have one in my pocket right now. We have invitations that I like to go and I use and I'll hand out. And on the back of the invitation, it says, the Bible way to heaven. Because I want people to know that. But that is not what I'm relying on for people to get saved is just here, read this. So there's nothing wrong with using that. I think it's fine to, you know, you give it to them. But what we're supposed to do is to, is to preach it to them and explain it to them and expound it to them. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch said, you know, when, when, it, when Philip asked him, you know, understand it's not what thou readest, he said, how can I understand except some man should show me? He can't, you, you know, lost people are not going to be able to understand the Bible. There's a veil over their eyes. They're not going to get it until they're saved. When they're saved, you know, the Bible is a spiritually discerned book. We can understand it when we have the Holy Ghost, and when we're saved, the veil's been removed from our eyes. You can understand these things. Now, what people will try to do that they want to justify only just handing out tracts, because I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier just to hand out a piece of paper than it is to boldly open up your mouth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not easy work. If you've never done it before, come on out with us and you'll see. I mean, it's a great work. It's exciting. It's invigorating. I mean, it's edifying. It's great doing that. It's great doing God's service. But it's not easy. It's definitely not the easiest thing that, that, that you'll ever do, preaching the gospel. And that's why a lot of people, they want to feel like they're doing what they're supposed to be doing just by handing out pieces of paper and pamphlets. That's not the case, but a lot of times what they'll say, I've heard people try to use this one verse as support to just say, well, this is why you should just hand out uh, tracts. And they'll say, Mark 13, 10 says, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. And they say, like, well, published, you know, like a book. You publish a book. But what's, what's stupid about that is that back when this was spoken, there was no printing presses. They're not going to be publishing these books. I mean... Do you know how difficult it was just to even transcribe the Bible and to just transcribe these things? It's not like they just had so much paper and so much writing materials in abundance. It was something that was that was not as easily available. We take it for granted today because it is. I mean, you go down to the dollar store and get a Bible. And amen for that. And, you know, praise God for that. But when he says publish, that just means, you know, spread abroad. That means just preached and spoken and published that every, you know, everyone should hear that and, and hear the message. But I'm going to give you a lot of examples. There's 98 verses in the Bible, nowhere, I'm not going to go through all 98, that the word gospel appears. Okay? And this is just to give you an idea of what you think we ought to be doing with the gospel, whether we should just be handing out a piece of paper or um, what we ought to be doing. 
And I'm going to try to rattle through these real quick, so this, just follow me here. Mark 4, 23, I'm going to start, we're going to start with Matthew. I'm just going to be going through most of the New Testament. It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 11, 5, the blind received their sight and the lame walked, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf are here, the le deaf the deaf here, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the world, in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial for Mark 1, 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 1, 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. And notice there he said, saying, this is what's coming out of his mouth. Believe the gospel. Mark 14, 9. Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. This also that she is, again, talking about the same book, uh, the same story in Matthew uh, chapter 24. And Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Luke 7, 22, The lepers are cleansed, the dead are here, the dead are raised up, to the poor the gospel is preached. Luke 9, 6, And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Is this enough yet? <laughs> Have we heard enough? Because i got a few more here. Again, 98 references to the word gospel. And not every single one uses the word preach. Not every single one does. A lot of times the gospel is referred to more as like a noun of just saying, like we're speaking about the gospel. But, I mean, ad nauseum you're going to see this. Luke 21, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel. Preached the gospel. Acts 8, 25, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Acts, 18, four, or Acts 14, 7, and there they preached the gospel. Now I'm going to quit with that. i got a few more here, but I think you get the idea. Almost, I mean, so many times throughout the Bible, I was just doing a study on this, when you see the word gospel, it's talking about preaching the gospel. It's talking about like using your mouth and preaching it. It's not just handing out pieces of paper. We need to be doing this. We need to incorporate this. If you haven't done this, incorporate this in your Christian life. This is what this church is, is, is commissioned to do, is to bring the gospel, to preach the gospel to the lost, to the poor, to the needy, to everybody. To the, the Bible, um, the, you often see the poor and other people um, kind of, you know, the Bible says that, uh, you know, preach first to the, to the poor. I mean, we're going to preach the gospel to every preacher, like, like it says in the book of Mark. But we're going we're gonna to preach to everybody. We're going to preach it to the poor. We're going to preach it to, to the rich, to everybody. And number three, okay, the importance of soul winning. Number one is hell. Number two is hearing. that We need to preach so that people can hear it. And number three, we're to heed the commandment to preach the word. We need to heed God's commandment because not only are people dying and going to hell, we ought to love them enough to preach the gospel to them so that they could not go to hell. In order for them to be saved, they need to hear it. But number three, God has commanded us to do this. This is not just, this is not optional in the Christian life. This is something that we need to be doing. Mark 16, 15, I already read this, but it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's called the Great Commission. This is the last thing, basically, that Jesus Christ left his disciples to say, Look, you need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God expects us to do this. God has committed unto us. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. God has committed unto us this ministry of the reconciliation. God is not going to come down from heaven and preach the gospel unto people and get them saved on his own. He's committed that task unto us as believers. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. It will be starting in verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things, verse 18, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself 
by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, the ministry of reconciliation is reconciling people to God. People in their lost state are not reconciled with God. They have this sin that is that is causing them to be um, to receive to, to deserve a punishment from God. They need to be reconciled. They need to get that, that debt that they owe reconciled with God. We have that ministry of the reconciliation. We are the ones that are that are to bring them the good news, the great news. Jesus Christ has paid that debt that you owe. Jesus Christ has paid everything that you need. That, that all of the sins that you've committed, all the sins you're going to commit in the future, all of that has been paid for, bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. We have that ministry of telling those people about that gift and about that good news. Look at verse number 19. It says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. This is where he's just defining what the, the ministry of reconcil rec reconciliation is. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation there. So he says it again. That has been committed unto us. That is our charge. That is something that we are responsible for. Look at verse number 20. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is a strong charge for us. This says we are ambassadors. Now if you think about an ambassador, Think about the importance an ambassador plays. I mean, even in just in this world, right? The U.S. has many ambassadors. There's many other countries that have ambassadors that come here. The ambassador is a representative. The ambassador is someone who's representing a nation, a group of people, somebody. That is someone that you send. And that, is a, that job has a very, a very high level of importance. That is not something that's just a task taken lightly. That is something that a lot of it, trust is given to the person to say, hey, look, you're representing all these people. You need to, to, to speak appropriately with them and on, on the behalf of the people you're representing. God has made us ambassadors for Christ. That's a, that's a pretty tall order. That's something we ought to take seriously. Listen. Christ has made us, we are supposed to be the ambassadors for Christ. <clears throat> representing Christ and explain to people what, you know, what God has for them and, and the gift that he has for them. And that's why he says at the end of verse 20, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He said, look, we're pleading with you, we're asking you, we're praying for you as if Jesus Christ were here. Jesus Christ is not here right now. He's not physically here on this earth. He may be here in spirit, but he's not physically here as he was when he was alive and walked around this earth. In his stead, since he is not physically here, we are here to bring you and try to reconcile you to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has chosen to use the foolishness of preaching. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you have to turn there, verse 21 says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching the gospel is extremely important. It's the only way that people are going to get saved. And it's committed unto us. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. We're going to see another charge for us, another commandment, and, and another reference that shows that, look, this is something that we are supposed to do. Jesus Christ commissioned us when he said, preach the gospel to every creature. We saw um, just in this last reference that, that God has made us ambassadors, and that, that we have the ministry of reconciliation. That's our job. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 16. Paul's saying here, he says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He's saying, woe unto me. Look, if I don't do this, that's woe unto me. He said, I have to do this. Look at verse number 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So he's saying here, look, if you do this thing willingly, God's got a lot of rewards for you. And that's, and you know, that's another incentive to go out soul winning. Besides just loving people and, and wanting, wanting them to avoid an eternal punishment of hell, 
And besides the fact that God's commanded us to do it, the Bible says that we're going to receive rewards for doing the work that he's, that he's commanded us to do, for going out and doing these things. The Bible says to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, not treasures on this earth. And one of the ways to do that is to go out. And when you win souls to Christ, that is going to help you to build up treasures for yourself, the treasures that are going to last in eternity. And then it says in, uh, he says in verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now we see here, he's saying, look, he's, he's using this, uh, this charge of being a master for Christ, and he's saying how he's doing it. He's look, I'm trying to become all things to all men. Right? I'm trying to get to people on their level. I want them to be able to relate to me. I want to be able to, to under, you know, them to understand this. And, but I like what he said in the part where he said, you know, those without law, as without law, so he's kind of, you know, Kind of looking like he's one of them, but at the same time, he said, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. And, you know, I mean, there, there's definitely a boundary. Don't cross. Don't, don't break God's law just to try to, to, to be all things to all men, right? And what I think this is like, you know, the Bible explains, and it's very clear, that we ought not to be touching alcohol, let alone even looking at it. The Bible says in uh, the book of Proverbs 23 that, you know, look not thou on the wine when it's red, when it giveth its cover color in the cup when it moveth itself aright and explains the dangers of alcohol and drinking. I don't think that God wants us to go into a bar and just have a beer and start getting drunk with people just to preach the gospel unto them. You know, we still should be under the law of Christ. But at the same time, you know, if you're trying to, to give someone the gospel and they're already lost, you know, you don't need to just be hammering on them on, on the drinking or hammering on them on some other sin that they have. You know, talk to them in terms they're going to understand and just, you know, kind of get on their level, but, you know, preach them the gospel. Try to get them saved first. If you work on the sin and get the sin out of their life later, get them saved first. Try to get them, give them the good news. And, uh, you know, I'm going to point out this last thing. A lot of people these days will get offended at the term of saving souls. So my servant is the importance of soul winning. Going out and winning souls to Christ. And a lot of people say, well, you're not winning souls. You're not doing it. You know, God is the one that saves people. You don't get anybody saved. God saves people. And you know what? Partially that's true because, of course, Jesus Christ is the, is the Savior. He is the one that saves the soul. But using this terminology is definitely biblical. There's nothing wrong with using this terminology. In, that, in the verse we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, what did Paul say? He said, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might, by all means, save some. Paul said that he was going to be the one saving people. And the reason is because it's a joint effort. God has, has called us to do this work where we're in the yoke with him. We are working together with Christ. Christ does not just do this all on his own. He has given us this job and said, look, you have to bring the gospel to every creature. You have to bring my word to them. I did all the hard work. Jesus Christ did all the hard work. He lived the perfect life. He did all the miracles. He suffered immensely when he allowed himself to be crucified and dead and buried and risen again from the dead. He did all the hard work. That's all him. All the glory goes to God. Jesus Christ loved us, that love that, that no man can match. He deserves the credit and the glory. Yet, at the same time, he's given us this, this ministry of reconciliation that it's our job to bring the gospel to people. So saying that when we go out soul winning, and hey, yeah, I got this person saved. Obviously, Jesus Christ saved their soul. But if you didn't go out and do that, I mean, unless somebody else did, that person would not have been able to hear and not have been able to make the choice to believe. And there's a few others here. I'll, just, I'll read this real quick for you. Romans chapter 11, verse 13 says, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some.
some of them. <laughs> and in, uh, yeah, that's, we read that one already. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 15, again, Paul said, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And, and Paul, oftentimes, you'll see to Timothy and to Titus, he refers to them as his son, his son in the faith. Because when you, when you preach the gospel to someone and they get saved, spiritually, I mean, of course God is their father, but in a, in a sense and in a way, the person that preaches the gospel to them and by whom they, they believe is also a father to them, which is why he's saying this. He says, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yeah, there's lots of pastors, lots of preachers, lots of people you can learn from and be instructed of Christ from. He said, you have not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. These are words that are used in the Bible. These are words that Paul used that were from the Holy Ghost. God's word pre preserved to us. And he says in 1 Timothy uh, 1, verse 2, he says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. So the reason why, you know, hopefully you'll notice with this church, everything that we do comes from the Bible. The term, down to the terms that we use, the terminology... The, the, the service, everything that we do, I try to we try to base on scripture. Because that's what matters. I mean it, it's it's we need to be right in God's eyes. It's not it's not pleasing man. It's not about pleasing anybody else. God has given us his instructions. God has given us his commands. God has given us the rules and what he wants for us to do. We need to as as closely as possible just just follow this book, follow what he has for us, and obey that. There's a lot of other reasons that we need to go solo. There's a lot of reasons we need to bring to bring the gospel to us. I've mentioned three. Hell, they have to hear. We need to heed God's commandments. This is one of the most important aspects. I've mentioned this before. This church, one of the biggest focuses and goals of this church is to go out and bring the gospel to every creature. I'll tell you this right now. Any church that does not do so and is not reaching the people, not reaching the lost, not bringing the gospel, that's a dead church. And that church is going to end up dying and withering away. There is going to be no growth because they're not doing what God wants them to do. They're not bringing the gospel. They're, not, they're failing at the one, the, the one of the greatest things that God has committed unto us to do. And their candlestick is going to be taken away. Like it says in the book of Revelation where he talks about some of the other churches that weren't doing the work that he sent for them. This is a church that first and foremost loves God. And we desire to please God by obeying his commandments and doing things the way that he has laid forth for us to do them. We also love people. We don't want to see them suffer. We don't want to see them go into hell. We want to reach them. We want to love them. We want to bring them the gospel so that they can get saved. We don't want them to go to hell. And the way to be the most effective at getting souls saved is by using God's methods, as we saw ad nauseum with the, with the gospel, especially when you're talking specifically about the gospel, God expects us to preach the gospel, not just to, to you know, hand a piece of paper or something like that. We need to preach God's word. God's word is going to get people saved. And, um, you know, I just hope, I hope something that was preached tonight, you know, people can, can take to heart. And, um, you know, again, it's not a pleasant thing. I don't like thinking about hell, but we have to. You know, it's something that's very motivating. It's something that we need to use to say, yeah. Whatever it is I'm doing here, um, you know, my hobbies or, or playing this game or doing some of these other things, that's not very important when you think about so many people that are lost and how we spend our time. I mean, I know a lot of things are important. Family is important. Working your job is important. Providing for your family. Coming to church, you know, doing a lot of other things are very important. But please, please do not forget the importance of going out and bringing the gospel to the lost. It's going to mean an eternity of difference to whoever's soul that gets touched, that, that makes that decision, that makes that choice. Those four souls today that confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, and I don't know their hearts. All I can take is what they said with their mouth. I believe that they believed with their hearts on the Lord Jesus Christ to save their soul. If they really did that, their, soul, their, their path has changed forever. And they're going to be going to heaven when they die. We need to keep that in mind. They were just saved from, from an eternity of hell. And um, we need to go out and continue to bring the gospel to them. Let's all right have a word for it. Dear Heavenly Father.